All right, why don't we get started? Um, I'm John Haig. I am the co-director of the Most of our Romani Center for Business and Government. Um, and we are incredibly fortunate today. We have our usual cast of Tom Wheeler, former FCC chair, um, and Gene Kimmelman, former deputy associate attorney general in the Department of Justice, both of whom are now senior research fellows here at the center. Um, and we're extremely, extremely fortunate uh, to have Senator Welch um, with us, uh, a Democratic senator from Vermont. Um, and we just feel it's a unique opportunity. So, thank, Senator, thank you very much for, for your willingness to join and, and spend some time with us. It's terrific. Um, I'm going to give you, I'm going to ask all of you, and just as a, as a little logistical reminder, we really want to make sure the senator hears your questions. Um, so, there's a button on this, and you need to push it. When you're going to talk, you should have a green light. And when you're done, push it and it'll be a red light. And with that, I will hand it over to um, Tom and we will um, start. And th again, thank you very much, Senator, for, for your willingness to join. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much. Senator, thank you. Again, I'll, I'll, I'll repeat what John said. You're, um, I'm glad to see that you were drinking your coffee or something. I hope you're having lunch because you'll see everybody here is having lunch as well. And right now you're competing, you're competing with the churros. Okay, <laughs> that's great. But this, um, so, so let me just give some background to everybody sitting here. Um, senator Welch is the junior senator from Vermont, just elected in the 2023 um, election. Um, but he's no stranger to Washington. He came to the House of Representatives in 2007 and um, was, and I, I have to add on a personal note that I was incredibly fortunate enough when I was chairman of the FCC to be able to work with then Congressman, now Senator Welsh. Um, he is a person who seeks to get things done not by polarizing but by working together and um and that was so many times a, a, a breath of fresh air um he's had just to give you all you students sitting around the room his the thing that probably will tell you more about peter welch than his um than his legislative background, which is non-trivial. But in the 1960s, he worked with the SCLC, so Southern Christian Leadership Conference, as a community organizer in Chicago. After This was after he had gotten out of Holy Cross, was it, Peter? You graduated yeah, from Holy Cross, right? I dropped right? out of Holy Cross. I, I, I spent what would have been my senior year there and then a year after as well. And so I just kind of put that out because somebody who puts at a young age his body on the line, in this case, the front lines, to make a difference tells you an awful lot about the kind of person you're dealing with. And so it's no surprise that we should see Peter Welch in the United States Senate and having accomplished what he accomplished while he was a member of Congress. So, Peter, we began... Um, we begin Monday with a seminar, um, much like the one that you and Senator Bennett and I did at Brookings a couple of weeks ago on the challenges of overseeing a digital economy. And, and I guess I want to pose a couple of questions and Gene, invite Gene to join in here. And then our goal is to shut up and let the students have a chance to interact with a United States Senator. And, um, and, and so, but to set the stage, what are the things that you worry about the most when you think about the impact of digital technology on our society, both now and what could be coming in the future? Well, you know, uh, thanks, Tom, and uh, uh, thanks, Gene, and, and I'm really uh, glad to be with you. 
Uh, you, you've made the point, Tom, and I really think it's the right one, is that there has been this massive new technology, you know, in the past 30 years, really, uh, that has come to be the dominant player in our economy. And uh, it has been extraordinarily successful. Uh, we've got five companies, you know, you, you take the, the top five and the, the, many of their market uh, valuations are significantly greater than many countries. And the Congress, when this was all beginning, uh, gave uh, Section 230 of freedom from liability uh, for anything that was published on uh, their uh, platforms. Uh, and the goal was to try to put the US in the best position to get the fastest and most successful uh, sort of technology economy going, and it worked. And what has happened as a result of that is that you've got these massive companies that have an enormous amount of impact. Um, and there's never been any public discussion about public values that we sought to achieve or public values that are being threatened with uh, this explosion in the world of technology. And as you point, as you pointed out in your book, you know, there have been other moments in our economy. Uh, where uh, the, 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 the creation of the railroads, for instance, uh, the consolidation of oil companies, where the capacity of a sector of the economy to grow very, very quickly, they end up being the ones that make the rules. And those rules obviously are the ones that are advantageous to their uh, profit maximization uh, with very little regard for the public interest. And in the past, when that has happened, with Congress very much playing catch up, uh, you've had uh, uh, Congress to act to try to create institutions that would then have as its goal protecting the public interest. And that could be everything from uh, privacy to competition uh, 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 to access. And, uh, and other you know, previous examples were the Securities and Exchange Commission to try to get a handle on what's going on in Wall Street. Uh, the Interstate Commerce Commission to deal with uh, the incredible abuse of the railroads when they were making their own rules and were devastating farm economies uh, throughout the country, but particularly the Midwest. And I see this as a parallel situation. Uh, again, I, I, I wanted to I acknowledge your, your insight into this. But you've got these massive companies with massive, massive impact on our uh, on our society, and you basically have no uh, public entity that is there a to regulate, b to set rules of the road, c to even define what the public interests are. So the major concerns that I think I have are what all of us had. I mean, one obvious is the competition. You know, what, what does it take for a young entrepreneur who wants to get started to be able to compete uh, in an, the world of Amazon? Uh, mental health is a huge issue. Uh, you know, there's uh, the, what's happened with social media. You know, the original pitch was it was going to connect us all together. And obviously, uh, it has not had that effect in the mental health crisis among uh, young people. Uh, uh, is is really severe and what role has social media played on that. In politics, obviously, the misinformation is rampant and what to do about it and how to do it is very, very problematic. But the, in, the misinformation that gets uh, sent around the world so quickly uh, in, the, in the, the capacity of folks who have a vested interest in getting out uh, misinformation to do that is, is enormous. Uh, and, you know, the other thing I really worry about is the uh, breakdown of community uh, where you've got all these uh, directional forces that are pulling things apart from the competition. So it's very tough for downtown businesses to have uh, economic viability uh, when that's so much a part of community life or when you have uh, so much information that really the capacity for trusted communication is compromised, which has real impacts on our uh, political system. Um, in, in when you've got this concentration of immense uh, wealth uh, in the hands of a few, uh, it just intensifying what I think is an extremely serious issue that we have in this country, and that's rising inequality. All of these things uh, uh, are really of concern to me. Um, and 
it, we're in a situation where clearly it's not as though you can do a one size fits all and come up with an answer to this or that. And you've got a Congress, by the way, uh, where a fair number of people were here before Facebook was founded. And there's a lot of turnover, uh, but it, it's not as though we're the most tech savvy kind of people. So my view is that we have to do with a digital commission. This is something that Senator Bennett speaks very well about and uh, is the co-sponsor of this bill, lead sponsor, really. Um, we have to set up an, an, a governmental entity uh, that's properly staffed with experts, with proper authorities uh, that include rulemaking and enforcement uh, that go through all of the issues that are relevant uh, to kind of protecting what Congress can define as public interest values, competition, privacy, uh, mental health, and it would be hopefully fairly flexible, but instead of relying on really what is a patchwork of authorities that are spread out across the various uh, entities in government, the FTC, the FCC, and, and so on, uh, try to have a dedicated institution that really is gonna take on the challenge of, of, of protecting public interest concerns uh, in this world that has essentially abdicated the authority uh, to the folks who were in charge, the Amazons, the Microsofts, the Googles, uh, uh, the Facebooks, and so on. So that's really the core underlying philosophy of this. What you're seeing in Congress is an immense amount of interest in doing something, uh, and that is on the Republican and Democratic side. Uh, there's a lot of concern about mental health, privacy, competition. I think that cuts across both party lines. Uh, there's a divide here among a lot of folks uh, in the Congress who think uh, that the efforts that we're making is really an effort to try to silence uh, political speech. You know, and, and I think that's, I, I, I totally disagree with that. But that's that's a narrative uh, that uh, is an impediment to us uh, that we'll have to overcome as we try to create this uh, digital commission. So that's the background, Tom, and I'll turn it back over to you and, and look forward to uh, engaging with the folks um, who I hope are having a good lunch. <laughs> well, thank you, Senator. Um, and I'll take that as my instructions here um, to look around the table. Um, okay, punch, punch your button. I'll. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, Senator, thank you for your time today. Um, my name is Clay Garner. I'm a master's uh, public policy uh, first year student here at the Kennedy School. And just recently, we've been studying um, particularly about autonomous vehicles and the impact that they'll be having um, in the currently, but also in the, uh, the growing impact in the future. You mentioned a little bit about da uh, data privacy, and that was one of the linchpins that we were running into when it came to autonomous vehicles, given the sheer amount of data that they, that they collect. Um, do you do you think that there's any likelihood in the coming years of the Senate or uh, House representatives approaching data privacy uh, from a lens similar to the Europeans with the European General Data Privacy uh, Regulation that they enacted in 2018? Or do you think that's too much of a too high of a goal? I don't think it is too high of a goal. I mean, you know, it's interesting you say the privacy. Imagine all that data, where you go, how you got there, and from that you can infer who you were with or what you were doing, that's incredible. Um, and the privacy should belong to the user, and I think that's what they do in Europe, uh, and not just have that be a product that gets monetized by, uh, by, the, by the agencies. But um, there is definitely in Congress a growing uh, recognition that what we have failed to do here has failed uh, the legitimate concerns of our, our citizens. So there's a number of us who are very interested in being uh, really much more assertive about public interest protection. And what, of course, is the case in Europe uh, is that they're, I think, uh, a good deal ahead of us. So there's growing, I think, uh, support for that. And I think that'll continue as new members of Congress come in. Can I just jump in here for a second and we'll go to you just to flesh something in yeah so when gene and phil verveer and i first published the paper here at hks 
on the need for a new digital agency. I got a call from this man who had read it and whose initial reaction was, we need this kind of a structure for dealing with what are going to be the expectations for privacy because we can't do it in detail in Congress and we right. got to give it to somebody who's got a broader. So, so it's fascinating that you and the first question <clears throat> hit the key issue that and I'm I'm speaking for you here, but I, right. but uh, but I think was the reason why you began exploring this con this concept in the first place. Well, it's, it's true, Tom. And you remember, you know, a very conservative colleague of mine, uh, Marsha Blackburn, she's a senator from Tennessee, but she was in the House with me. And I think back in 2013 or 2014, we started a bipartisan working group on privacy. Um, and uh, we came at it a little bit differently, but the common thread for us was we really thought uh, the, the, the information that gets accumulated uh, should be the product that, that, sh that should be belong to the individual. It shouldn't be monetized and then used in uh, ways that you just didn't even know how it would be used. And that was one of the first sort of concentrated organized efforts to try to address at least one of the issues related to big tech. And since then, uh, there have been lots of individual bills that are raised. Uh, the Kids Online Safety Act, uh, uh, there's a, another digital uh, a bill with Senator Warren and Senator Graham, but uh, th there's, a, th there's some legislation about medical privacy. And what you're seeing is that various members of Congress will essentially get motivated by addressing an issue that's related to big tech. And it's really, really difficult and complicated because any decision that we make on one bill is gonna have an effect elsewhere. And uh, I don't know if you've noticed, but Congress has a kind of a hard time staying on task at, <laughs> at times. So uh, it really led us uh, to believe that if we're gonna put our arms around the various uh, challenges that are coming up, uh, that you really have to have an organization, a governmental entity that's tasked with that challenge. And it can be flexible. It can be. It can sustain the work and the effort with the research, uh, with the hearings, and also uh, obviously with input from all the affected people. So that's that's the theory here, and I think it's really true because Congress just can't do a leg piece of legislation here and one there and so on to address the various things that come up. Everything from competition to medical privacy. So thanks, Tom. Okay. Yes, sir. Thank you very much. I'm Freddy Guevara uh, from Venezuela and also a mid-career student here at the Kennedy School. Um, also a congressman from Venezuela, but uh, in exile. Oh, and, great. My goodness. Well, yeah. my, my, uh, oh, thank you so much. We're going through so no, much. No, you, the, the support that we have for our cause in bipartisan, uh, bipartisan ways has been very important for us, really. In the Thank Senate you. and in the House, uh, we're, we're, the Venezuelans were very grateful for all, all of the work that you have done in Capitol. And I, my, my question is related to two topics specifically, one about uh, advanced AI and the second one about algorithms. And I would like to know two things like, how's that discussion in, in the United States? You know, how, how's that discussion? Uh, how um, how's people perceiving it? Uh, it's are people aware that the dangers and the implications that they can have? And if that is going on, how is discussion related to what other countries can do? Because I think that these type of technologies are kind of like the nuclear proliferation treaty, right? I mean, the United States can do all of the things, but then if the uh, China Communist Party develop a dangerous uh, super AI, well, it can uh, surpass United States capacity. So that's just an example. So I wanted like to, to pick um, your brain and, and what are your thoughts and what's the state of the art in, in related to those two areas? <laughs> well, uh, thank you very much. Uh, an AI, actually, uh, Senator Schumer uh, has got four people, two Republicans and two Democrats, uh, where they're set, they've been setting up uh, forums 
where we've been hearing from everyone from the uh, chief executives of the big platforms uh, to privacy experts, to folks who uh, really can talk about algorithms. But the premise is that we don't want to have happen with AI what happened with uh, big technology back when we passed Section 230. In other words, when we were doing the big tech, we basically gave the keys to the kingdom over to the tech companies without asking any questions about what should be guidelines, what are potential downsides, how do we address them. So the, the, the desire here with these forums that we're having is to get engaged on a congressional level uh, before, not after, uh, everything happens. Now, having said that, it's easier said than done because, you know, AI in the algorithms uh, is really exploding and there is not an awareness uh, or a mechanism by which to address what are uh, the problems that can follow up with this. But that inquiry that, that you're pointing out or, or suggesting needs to happen is happening. Where that's going to end up, I don't know. You know, the algorithms, I don't totally know about what you're saying with the algorithms, but th this algorithm issue on tech, so this may not be addressing your question, it does go to the Section 230 because, as you know, there's total uh, immunity uh, for anything that's on one of these platforms, no matter how vile, no matter how vicious. But the real beef that a lot of us have with that immunity is it's one thing for a platform to have on it something I put on that's libelous or terrible, but it's another thing when the algorithms that that platform uses um, amplify what is misinformation or hate speech or things that really have mental health consequences. And of course, the current business model for a lot of these platforms is they get more revenue when they get more hits and more hits come with the more controversial or incendiary uh, the post is. So uh, that that I'm talking about algorithms in the current context, not algorithms in the context of AI. But I'll stop there and, and uh, maybe you can, if you want me to, uh, 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 give me a little more guidance I can try to address in a little more uh, uh, direct way. No, uh, in, in the terms of algorithm, I was like uh, talking about um, the use of algorithms, for example, to examine reincarceration and loans. And there's so many, there, there's a big author uh, called Kathy O'Neill that, oh, right. um, uh, yeah. That, that was my no, question about there's that. Huge, there's huge concern about that. I mean, you know, in the old days, when you redlined a neighborhood, you, you knew, you know, people of color lived in the neighborhood, you put a red line around it, and they couldn't get mortgages or insurance. It was outrageous. In fact, Tom Wheeler was talking about me working in Chicago, and it was on housing discrimination where I really got uh, engaged in my community organizing, and the banks wouldn't loan uh, to a family in Lawndale and the families in Lawndale were black and it wasn't based on what their credit rating was, it was based on their neighborhood and the FHA uh, wouldn't loan. Uh, but now with algorithms, I mean, you can, you can find all kinds of ways to conceal a bias uh, and get the outcome you want, namely to not have quote risky loans uh, or less profitable loans. So, you know, that's an area in, fra in fact, where I would think this digital agency could play a significant role because that is totally outrageous <clears throat> to use technology to facilitate discrimination. Great, anybody else? Um, hello, can you hear me? Hi, yeah. Okay. Um, hi, my name is Eva Richter. I'm an MPP student here at the Kennedy School. And my question is regarding um, the approach to regulation, because you mentioned that um, you sort of want to move to a more proactive approach to regulation rather than a reactive approach. So the first question is, how closely are you looking at what the European Union is doing in terms of the AI Act and the Digital Service Services Act? And then the second question is, um, what do you think um, with the, the AI Act that we have seen um, two weeks ago, what do you think is still lacking in terms of the, the, the regulatory tools that you have available in terms of making 
um, more proactive or having a more proactive approach to regulation? You know, frankly, we don't have many tools at all here. You know, the, 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 we're not, re a lot of us are looking at what is going on in Europe as a guide to what might be possible for us to do here. And what's clear in Europe is that they take this privacy issue, uh, I think, more seriously than we do, even if there's a lot of lip service paid to it here. Um, and it's also clear that uh, the, the big companies uh, uh, have more clout uh, in pushing back against regulatory actions that they don't want uh, here than they have in Europe. But I think the heart of why uh, Senator Bennett and I are proposing our bill is because we're not going to win this and succeed by passing a single bill. We've got to have a capacity to have an institutional mechanism that is there all of the time, getting input, getting information, doing studies, uh, raising questions, uh, and then through the process of making rules, uh, and even suggesting potential legislation to have a, a fully funded, fully staffed, fully trained uh, you know, entity uh, that can be on the job on a full-time basis. We just don't have that now. And it's really impossible the way Congress is set up. And really, with, and this isn't, in this respect, it's not a criticism of Congress, but you've got this legislative body where uh, uh, it, it, you don't have this expertise uh, because we're all generalist here and have to deal with all the various things that come up uh, in Congress. So that's the whole heart of why uh, Senator Bennett and I believe that you have to have this kind of entity. So if I can pause one second for a commercial message here. Um, we literally, Gene and John Haig and I just finished a meeting talking about next semester here at HKS and how the seminars and the study groups are gonna move next semester and what's happening in Europe and the impact of that. Cause finally we, they've moved from enacting to now enforcing and what are the decisions being made and what are the impacts over here of those decisions is one could be one of the key things that we're going to be talking about next semester. So well, that's great. we'll see you. We'll see you then. Okay. Anybody else? We got back. Oh, I'm sorry. Yes. Got it. Is pushing the green. Yes. Okay. Hello, Senator. My name is Veronica. Also, an MPA student here. I'm from Brazil, and I wanted actually to follow up on a question uh, uh, we had here on Monday on another session with Professor Wheeler and Professor Hay. Uh, given that this regulation will come to life at some point, we spoke a lot about uh, some changes that sh uh, should uh, uh, also happen in the body of government on hiring and having people that know uh, technology and like are more agile. And so also changing at some extent, the structure of people that are hired, the paid rates to, to people, because we see that it's a different profile and how if that ever happens, like we, uh, you are actually able to enforce these changes on regulation. How do you see uh, these changes that should be uh, done uh, within, like personal uh, uh, hiring and 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 moving on with this kind of body that you are envisioning? Well, are you are you talking about the salaries that would be paid, and could they be competitive uh, so that we would get high quality people? Is that the is that where you're heading on this? I think it's not only salaries. I think like it's a, a whole kind of new people that you need to tackle this kind of challenges, right? Well, you know what, I think uh, it's, a, it's a really good question, but you know, my my sense all the time is that. Well, first of all, there's a lot of younger people who get how out of control the uh, the tech world is and the big platforms are, and and understand it uh, because they see it in their lives and they see the limitations on what they can do in their own lives as a result of the big tech powers that goes on addressed. 
And I think there, you know, this is maybe just the idealism in me and the optimism in me, but um, if there is an exciting new agency that's set up and it has a mission that people uh, who are really smart can identify with and they see it as an opportunity to do some good, uh, my hope is that that would attract people, sort of like, uh, you know, in my day, a big, big place for my, I, I went to law school and I remember um, the, the, how much excitement there was among a lot of my uh, fellow students. I went to Berkeley uh, to get a job in the civil rights division uh, of the Justice Department. And th that was less pay than they could get going to Wall Street or K Street. Uh, but you know, this is a real big issue. So if we actually could get behind congressionally a uh, new agency and it was empowered and there was some sense of excitement that it was gonna have some muscle to be able to take on these challenges, would that attract really smart uh, people? Uh, I think it would, I hope, I hope it would. Thank you very much, Senator. Um, my name is Thilo Kerkhoff. I'm also an MPP student and originally from Germany. And I have one question on the Trade and Technology Council, um, which was established between the European Union and the United States, and which in the beginning also was talking about artificial intelligence and some kind of standardization. Um, what is your take on the potential of a shared regulation or perhaps some shared standards on artificial intelligence between the United States and Europe, and particularly opposed to systemic rivals both can, both regions or both countries have? I think it makes a lot of sense. I mean, I mean it really does. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, we, we've got a lot in common, obviously, um, with the European Union and, and the, the values, I think, are largely shared. And I think it makes an immense amount of sense uh, to have a shared a set of standards. Uh, that That's always in my view, a pretty good thing uh, to have. So uh, I'd be supportive of that. Senator, great to see you. Um, we really appreciate you joining us today. So I wanted to pick up on a few of the themes here. So let's say in March in Europe, they start getting compliance with their new Digital Markets Act. And all of a sudden you see opportunities for more app stores. You see opportunities for more payment systems through different apps. All of a sudden you see Google sharing its click and query data and also having to share um, all the data with publishers that they generate um, through the, the various Google uh, products. Um, and you have like one of the greatest track records in Congress you mentioned Senator Blackburn in your previous um, comment on privacy, working across the aisle, working with Republicans. Um, with these new developments in other parts of the world, with the broad array of issues you, you've identified um, and the desire to create an agency that most Republicans tend not to like too much regulation, from right. my experience. Right. Um, right. Walk us through a little bit your thinking, because you, you talk to these folks day in and day out. You deal with them all. Um, and, and again, you're the master at, at, at figuring out some of these collaborations. What do you think, what, what starts triggering some change in that thinking or bringing people together a little bit more um, so it's not the siloed, we're only doing privacy or we're only doing 230, but we're looking at the, is there something in your mind that you think galvanizes that, that kind of collaboration? Well, you know, let me step back for a minute. Um, we got kind of a sketchy scene here in the United States Congress. Um, and uh, uh, <laughs> I don't know, you know, we're, we went from three weeks of not being able to have a speaker of the House of Representat Representatives to uh, what became nearly a fistfight uh, between uh, the Teamster and uh, U.S. Senator. Uh, thanks God for my friend Bernie Sanders who told people to <laughs> sit down. And I'm saying that because uh, the, there's a real crisis in our democracy here uh, where that sense of collaboration and collective uh, uh, effort has been really uh, compromised. And of course you saw that with January 6th and you're, you, that, that's still playing out. So that has a, a really detrimental impact on being able to like uh, uh, settle down and just focus on the common 
uh, challenges that we face. Uh, so I'm not going to give a prediction that it's all going to be easy to do. But the fact is, and this is the unifying fact, it's why Marsha Blackburn and I were able to work on this, if we can get past, you know, these forces that are uh, so dominant here about a fake election and, and, and all the other uh, elements that are distractions from the role of politics, which is to try to come together and solve shared problems. Um, but the reality is that small businesses in Marsha Blackburn's Tennessee district are really getting squeezed, just like small businesses in Vermont. The mental health of kids in Tennessee is really under stress, no different than the kids in Vermont. Um, your privacy rights are being compromised by this monolith. Uh, whether you live in a red state or a blue state. So, you know, this goes to why I approach things the way Tom was saying. The challenges we face, you know, they they cut across the red-blue divide. So that's the potential for us to be able to do something. And the classical conflict that you have with the Democrat and the Republican, where they're less for regulation, where, where we see regulation more as a, as a tool, uh, if it's not overdone. That's always there. Uh, but the opportunity we have by trying to hang in and get something done is that the challenges that Narsha Blackburn and her very red district face, her small businesses, her kids, her parents, they're really not different than what folks in blue Vermont have to deal with. So that's you know, that's my job to try to push that and to show that we're working on something that's going to be mutually beneficial. Uh, and, uh, and, and it's, it, you know, this, the squeeze that technology puts on a lot of our businesses is really, really of concern to, I think, a lot of people, uh, Republican and Democrat. So we just got to hang in and keep doing the work as best we can. And when Europe starts uh, unfolding, these station these new laws and so you get more app stores you get more payment systems you get more opportunities from google in europe do you think that has any impact in the in absolutely the you know gene i really do because then it's not an abstract discussion you know if they actually do this and it works and you're seeing that prices come down uh, or you're seeing that uh, app stores app, apps app, the applications go up um and it works then it's not an abstract discussion about whether you're regulating. It's a concrete discussion about, hey, they do it this way and here's what's happened, okay? So that can be really beneficial, really beneficial. Uh, I just wanna ask, I think you alluded, <clears throat> Hello. Can you hear hi. me? I can now, yep. Okay, hi. Sorry. I think you alluded to it a little bit earlier. Sorry? Yeah. Oh, sorry. I'm Yong Ting. Uh, I'm from uh, MPP program in uh, HKS. Uh, so I, I think uh, my question is sort of on the uh, idea of like, you know, how regulators themselves, they don't really have a uh, very in-depth knowledge of AI. And I think you talked about it a little bit earlier about how like, um, you know, setting up this soft entity might help in, in that in that, uh -huh. uh, in that that regard. So I, I think my question is just how like, how would you, how, how would this entity be formed? How would we go about, you know, doing that? And then what would this entity do to um, sort of advise the regulators on, 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 on you know, what, what they needed to know? I think that's something that's kind of important because as even as a, a student here, I don't know that much about AI, but it's something that I want to learn about and I want to learn about how to regulate it. Well, you know, as with any organization, let's say it's the Securities and Exchange Commission, you're going to have a, a lot. You're going to have a lot of, of different people who have to contribute to the effort. But bottom line, in order to have credibility for that organization, you're going to have to have people who are extremely competent um, in AI uh, or in technology. Just like at the Securities Exchange Commission, you're going to have to have some people who really understand the intricacies of how stock, stock offerings are, are made. Um, so that's a building process, but where there has to be a dedication to getting um, as personnel who are going to be obviously essential to the success or failure that are extremely competent and knowledgeable and uh, committed uh, to developing that expertise in the agency. 
And, you know, you, we do have examples of, of governmental agencies at various times that have just been the place to be uh, because they, and they attract really good people uh, to do work. And it's a lot of folks who probably, in the case of doing that, give up a higher salary elsewhere. At the end of the day, they'll all do all right. But that that's the building process. But that, you know, what, what, what Senator Bennett and I are doing and saying with our colleagues is look, we just got to have an entity that we staff, that we fund, that is there to be facing these challenges. And by the way, to be then looking into what Gene was saying, if Europe does it another way and you actually get real information about what they did and what its impacts are, and then you get some studies about how if we did it that way, it would increase competition here. That's getting the tools you need to be persuasive uh, to colleagues down the road about uh, new legislative approaches to things. So uh, I just don't see how we get our arms around the complexities without having an institution that's devoted uh, in its statement of purpose to that effort. Okay, so we have yeah. promised the Senator 45 minutes here and we're about to, we're the last five minutes of yeah. the of the clock. So yes, sir. And then we're going to give our leader, John, the last word. Oh, I get a question. Excellent. You know. <clears throat> uh, thank you, Senator. So um, I was just thinking about uh, the point that you mentioned about, oh, sorry. Uh, I'm Charlie and I'm MPID one. That's like masters of public administration and international development. Uh, and I was just thinking about like the point where, where it talked about algorithms being um, like uh, they have like tend to have embedded biases. Uh, and uh, the thing is that a lot of algorithms could not, uh, they could be neutral or they could be um, equitable. And um, there's even like a nonprofit called like Algorithm Justice League, uh, which tended to like, I, uh, source like people around the world to identify like biases around them and the point being the algorithm itself it could be neutral completely neutral it, it, um, it depends more on the models that you choose right and right. so uh that will lead to the point that would the public uh like um identify and actually change that rhetoric about biased algorithms and we actually set the rules uh, for algorithms or a framework for algorithms to be neutral as they should be instead of like uh, embedded biases uh, determined by a business model. But um, on the other hand, we're seeing that people are using Google infrastructures everywhere. It's embedded in people's life and um, it's impossible to like remove just like a single part of right. it or to try uh -huh. to alter, alter that. So are we saying that by establishing a new agency, we are trying to compete with that embeddedness in our daily life and like set a new rhetoric for our algorithms that's um, used like uh, and extracted in people's lives. Uh, and how would we compete with that if we don't have like existing infrastructure that's um, that's utilized uh, or I, I uh, on the other hand, I see a lot of like public infrastructure already that's also like embedded in people's lives. And how would we leverage that or how would we build like a connection or cooperation between public agencies to enhance and like empower that public data collection and uh, trying to establish something that's more equitable and that's um, competitive against uh, the private models. Yeah, right. that would be no, you've got you've got a lot uh, packed into your um, your observations and, and, and okay. questions. Um, and it really, what you just described is the reason why I think we do need an agency because there was a lot packed in there: the public versus the private. What's embedded in an algorithm? How do you get to the core of what's in that algorithm? What motivates it? What its effect is? Um, and each one of those inquiries uh, is a task and a big one. And if you have folks um, uh, in an agency where you raise one of these questions, <clears throat> they can pursue it uh, to see where there's a public interest, where there's a need to uh, examine the algorithm itself to see if it's embedded bias that's within it. Uh, so 
you know, you're in a way making my point about why the only way to approach this um, is through an institution as opposed to a one-off response to each one of these things that uh, were among the many things that were uh, packed into your comments. All right, last question. Um, so I'm gonna try to pick up on a, a number of various comments that people have made, and it has to do with the formation of this agency. And um, if I understand that the digital commission could be a precursor to the formation of potentially a digital agency. And what I'm trying to understand and how the sausage is made, I guess, um, you know, in high school, we learned the civics approach of, you know, <clears throat> Congress rights legislation and agencies implement, enforce it. They have a notice and comment procedure to develop the regulations and that whole process. And I'm trying to figure out, is the agency basically a bit of an alternative to the inability of Congress to integrate across all these disparate pieces and forms of legislation? Or is it a complement to that in some way um, that's building from the existing, it's got to build from the existing legislation, but is right. the notion that there may not be other forms of legislation, so they need to take those tools, but take a holistic view. Well, I do think that, I mean, there's two things. Number one, this question of Congress delegating authority to an administrative agency. That is a very uh, a, a challenge political uh, right. fight that we're in right now. And the Supreme Court, in my view, is playing a very detrimental role in this. Uh, <clears throat> but it has historically been the case that Congress can delegate authority uh, to an agency like the Securities Exchange Commission, like the Federal Communications Commission, where essentially that delegation defines what it is in the public interest and then the implementation of that uh, to an agency. And a lot of my counterparts here in Congress are against any delegation of authority to an agency. They think that anything we do in the environment like to the regulation of clean air, we have to pass a specific bill about how many parts per million of this or that contaminant can be in the building. And it's an effort, you know, this is the whole attack on the so-called administrative state. So we're gonna have that battle here about getting a new agency. But the second thing is that in the agencies when they've traditionally been set up and they have been forever, you know, as I mentioned, FCC, FCC, FTC, uh, Consumer Protection Finance Board, the tools they have are to hold hearings, to conduct investigations, to do rulemaking where you set rules of the road. There's public input, as you mentioned, is to collect information from digital platforms that are necessary for regulation and oversight. So we actually have real information that we're reacting to. They can do research, uh, including through grant making and collaboration uh, with financially disinterested third parties. Uh, and they have the capacity to impose penalties. So, you know, Barney Frank used to say, the only thing worse than no regulation, but the only thing worse than bad regulation is no regulation. Uh, and I'm kind of a believer in that. So I think regulation properly done is an appropriate tool to protect the public interest. But that battle is one that's being fought on a macro level here. Uh, a significant number of my colleagues want basically to dismantle any of these uh, regulatory institutions that we have. Um, and then there's the concrete challenge of what are the interests that we wanna have protected. So Senator, we have now overstayed yeah. our welcome by five minutes. Um, thank you. And- um, Great to be with you guys. And students, you know, students, you, you just had a unique opportunity. You know, one of the most thoughtful and direct, I mean, you didn't hear BS flowing here, you heard direct, direct answers, um, honest and forthright members of the United States Senate. Peter, we're really grateful you could be with us today. Thank you. No, great to be with you guys. See you later. Thank you, Senator. Bye-bye.